Madam Chairman, first of all, my salutations and greetings to you for organizing such an eminent, dynamic, far-reaching, and forward-looking event as this. You have done wonders. I know that this is already the second successive event of this sort, and you have established an impressive tradition. Secondly, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm deeply touched by what you said. I am, of course, not indifferent to what has been happening to this people, to this country, to this part of Europe. And I consider myself enormously fortunate that I could relate my deep sentiments to purposeful action on behalf of the leading democracy of the world to which I became attached by the consequences of the war, but in which I reposit my greatest hopes, not just for Poland, not just for America, but for humanity. And I particularly <laughs> and I particularly appreciate your double service, first as the Prime Minister of Poland, where you gained enormous international respect, and then as one of the leaders of Europe, where you gained respect both as the individual in charge of a major European institution, but also as a testimonial to the fact that Poland is now an important and free international player. So I'm grateful to you because I value what you have been and are continuing to contribute. I could go on in this vein and spend the whole evening saluting people in this room at the table at which I was just sitting. I have close friends who I will not en enumerate anymore by name who have made such immeasurable contributions to the restoration of the Polish economy and to the credibility of the Polish state internationally. And there are others in this room with whom I have been engaged in a common endeavor to transform what here once existed, to transform something that existed here in spite of the will of the people. And that was evil and was a misfortune and was a cruel judgment of history at the end of the war which produced so many victims and some of the victims then remained victims for another 50 years. So I have endless obligations of personal gratitude and respect for those of you who are here and where you had to take real personal risks, and I, some that, and I know that some of you spent time behind prison bars, and that is a much more meaningful test of commitment than my own role abroad, which may have had the advantage of power behind it, but which did not include, and I admit this openly, any real personal risk on my part. I did what I could because I was convinced that it should be done. And I consider myself to be lucky, together with you, of the outcome. But now is the time to pass to the present and to look ahead. And the, and the departure and the point of departure of my speech today is recognition of the new basic global reality that global dominion by any single power is no longer a realistic international prospect. 
However, at the same time, we have to face the fact that the world is more vulnerable to growing global chaos. Hence, responsible nation states have no choice but to promote wider geopolitical cooperation. And Europe, particularly, has the opportunity, as well as the historical obligation, to shape and to participate directly with America in the quest for such broader cooperation. Even as recently as during the previous century, which ended just a little more than a decade ago, the grandiose goal of global domination was still the guiding motivation of two ideologically ambitious totalitarian states. Global hegemony, but either one of them could have emerged as a consequence of the destructive wars fought largely on European soil. Hegemony might have also been the result of the prolonged worldwide Cold War rivalry between the North American and the Eurasian continental superstates. Not surprisingly, the one-sided but peaceful victory of America over Soviet Russia gave birth to the brief but widely shared illusion that the 21st century would hence be the American century, with the United States acting as the world's benevolent hegemon. 20 years later, 20 years later, a truly comprehensive American global domination is no longer possible. That is so for several reasons. In recent decades, worldwide social change has experienced unprecedented historical acceleration, particularly because instant mass communications, such as radio, television, and the internet, cumulatively have been stimulating a universal awakening of mass political consciousness. The resulting widespread rise in worldwide populist activism is proving inimical to external domination of the kind that prevailed in the age of colonialism and imperialism. Persistent and highly motivated populist resistance of politically awakened and historically resentful peoples to external control has proven to be increasingly difficult to suppress as protracted guerrilla warfares in Vietnam, Algeria, or Afghanistan have amply demonstrated. And as the rising turmoil in both the Middle East and Southwest Asia are foreshadowing. At the same time, the acquisition by the major powers of weaponry of increasingly destructive capabilities has made the notion of victory in a nuclear war among them prohibitively costly. That has prompted a degree of self-restraint that was absent in the pre-atomic age, age in relations among major powers. Last but not least, the ongoing shift in the center of gravity of global political power from the west to the east, dramatized by the rise of China and of Asia more generally, signals conclusively the onset of a historically new and more complex distribution of global power. In that much more complex historical and geopolitical setting, democratic America admittedly is still the world's most powerful, the richest, and the most influential state. Therefore, much still depends on how America conducts itself in world affairs. 
but to a much greater degree than in recent past. A great deal now depends also on the conduct of other major powers. We would all probably agree that any list of the contemporary world's geopolitically most important states would include America, China, Russia, not the European Union as such, because of its lack of political cohesion, but more specifically Germany, France, and Great Britain, and in the East, Japan, as well as India. And of course, China, which I've already mentioned. Unfortunately, each of these currently most significant states is in one fashion or another experiencing serious systemic handicaps that reduce and constrict the respective capacity for shaping world affairs. To be more specific, today's American political system is increasingly gridlocked and unable to address effectively the country's serious domestic economic financial problems, especially those that are generating growing social inequality. At the same time, America's global legitimacy has been damaged in recent years by its, in, by its unilateral reliance on military power, especially in the Middle East, while its infrastructural renewal has been burdened by the high financial costs of prolonged local wars. In the near future, America's global influence could be further jeopardized by the likely consequences of any war with Iran. China, despite its historically unprecedented and truly remarkable modernization, is showing signs of internal political stress between its ruling bureaucracy and the increasingly nationalistic armed forces and of a growing restlessness among the younger portions of China's newly prosperous middle class regarding the political system's controls over their mounting aspirations. Concurrently, geopolitical tensions between China and some of its several key Asian neighbors, notably Japan and India, are beginning to be ominously reminiscent of similar animosities a century ago in Europe. Russia, especially under Putin, is currently dominated by nostalgia for imperial status and hopes of seducing and absorbing Ukraine in this regard for its own socio-economic retardation, its demographic crisis, the brain drain of its best talent, and is facing a potential threat inherent in the growing gap between China's modernization and the diminution of the Russian population in Russia's Far East. At the same time, growing violence in the Caucasus is placing in jeopardy the prospects for a peaceful Winter Olympics in Sochi, while Islamic fundamentalism is beginning to seep from Central Asia into Russia's southern regions, including Tatarstan. The fact is that Russia is yet to make a realistic appraisal of what its future global role actually can be. At present, a political European Union is obviously still a distant reality, with the existing European Union sadly proving that it is in fact less a union than its recent and smaller predecessor, the European Community. 
The unfortunate result is that today's Europe, as such, counts for little in the world's political affairs. Only several individually more powerful European states, with two of them enjoying their privileged post-World War II status as veto wielders in the UN, occasionally act on an ad hoc basis as serious international players, but one of the two, Great Britain, is also reluctant to fully identify itself as European. Japan, traumatized by its tragic fate in 1945, is a good citizen of the world, but a passive global power and still hesitant about its proper role. The victim of territorial unilateralism on the part of Russia and the target of bitter war memories on the part of China, Japan's regional isolation is further intensified by the continued mutual animus with its immediate neighbor, South Korea, in the face of intensifying tensions with China, for Japan, the bilateral link to America is currently its only security blanket. Last but not least, India, the most populated country in the world, entertains large global aspirations, has high self-esteem, and significant military forces, but lags visibly behind China in its economic dynamism, modernization, and power. Moreover, its conflict with Pakistan, the latter a de facto ally of China, places it in potential danger, while the unresolved territorial disputes and conflicting international ambitions, especially with China, represent an ever-present challenge to peaceful stability between the world's two most populous states. Last but not least, the ethnic, linguistic, and religious mosaic of India has some ominous similarities to the former Soviet Union. In today's world, Eurasia, writ large, is the central arena for potentially disruptive international conflicts arising out of the foregoing condition. It is the setting for latent as well as for our already surfacing territorial disputes, conflicts over mineral or water rights, collisions over maritime demarcations, not to mention religious, linguistic, and ethnic animosities. The existing conflicts in the Middle East and the surfacing nationalistic tensions in Asia thus pose the risk of a further spread of regional violence with potentially serious international consequences. A larger war over a fragmenting Syria or an American conflict with Iran precipitated by Israel could in turn have seriously debilitating consequences for the currently already vulnerable world economy. To make matters even worse, in the longer run, the currently still facing Pacific rivalry between America and China could in some circumstances become increasingly antagonistic. Highly visible pressures in the direction of mutual hostility have lately been rising in both countries. I view as particularly ominous in that regard the fact that some recent American and Chinese publications have been previewing openly the possibility, indeed in striking military detail, of an eventual armed collision between these two leading states. 
That makes it all the more important that America as well as China both take steps to reassure each other that their current global preeminence is not fated to degenerate into a dangerously destructive global conflict. In any case, none of the world's leading powers is currently capable of promoting on its own the needed framework for enduring continental geopolitical stability in Eurasia. That heightens the special importance of more assertive engagement on the part of states with the till now underutilized constructive potential for playing significant regional roles. In Europe, I have particularly in mind the economically powerful Germany and the strategically increasingly important Turkey. On the global scene, Japan, the world's number three economy, could and should likewise increase its international profile. But today, here in Sopot, near the spot where the war that nearly destroyed all of Europe started some 65 years ago, I focus particularly on Europe and its future vocation. Europe, with America's encouragement and continued commitment to Europe's security, needs its own bold vision of an eventually wider European political community beyond the current limits of the existing European Union. In the course of the next several decades, that could involve intermediate confederal arrangements, embracing specifically, first of all, Turkey, and eventually Ukraine, as well as also Russia. Germany, as Europe's leading and most successful power, could and should be playing the central role in such an endeavor particularly in the wake of its successful reconciliation, first with France and subsequently with Poland. France, thanks to its historical self-confidence, opened the way to Germany's post-World War II acceptance as a leading European state. And that is France's enduring accomplishment. More recently, Poland, to its credit, showed geopolitical wisdom in stating openly and in spite of painful historical memories that a more decisively leading European foreign policy role by the economically successful and democratically solid Germany is in Europe's interest if Europe is to become truly Europe. It is also pertinent here to note that Turkey's own modernization, launched almost a century ago, was very much driven by Ataturk's admiration for German society. Despite occasional setbacks, since then, Turkey's resulting and still ongoing modernization and secularization have proven to be a remarkable success. With Germany in the lead, and with Germany taking advantage also of Poland's historical ties with both Turkey and Ukraine, a constructive German-led European outreach to the southeast, namely to Turkey, and to the east, namely to Ukraine, and eventually Russia, could revitalize Europe's historical self-confidence and promote a more ambitious vision of Europe's future. In that context, 
It needs also to be stated bluntly that the persistent de facto exclusion of Turkey from the European Union reflects not only a lack of European strategic ambition, but actually the lack of strategic common sense. A Turkey ever more closely linked to Europe would enhance European security. It would promote the prospects for stability in the important oil-producing Caspian region, increase the security of Georgia and Azerbaijan, and by closer cooperation across the Black Sea, fortify Ukraine's independence. In contrast, a frustrated and isolated Turkey, permanently excluded from Europe, could eventually become a transmission belt for the spread of the Middle East's political, ethnic, and religious disorders into the Balkan regions of Europe itself. Russia, too, deserves to have a better future option than the feckless imperial course on which Putin seeks to embark it. The fact is that none of the newly independent post-Soviet states wish to be subject again to the Kremlin. They will do what they can do to avoid a binding subordination to Moscow under the guise of the currently Kremlin-promoted Eurasian Union, while the resentment of it could even infect their new national pride with religious extremism. Paradoxically, to the new post-Soviet states, a Russia that is engaged in forging closer links with a larger Europe could be a more acceptable sponsor of greater economic integration throughout the space of the former Soviet Union. The new states would then fear less the potential restriction of their sovereignty, and Russia, itself connected more closely to Europe, would then be more likely to have a greater global influence. Fortunately, there is growing evidence that Russia itself is changing in ways that before long will make its present regime obsolete. A new, younger, and more Western-minded middle class is emerging. It knows the world. It is increasingly European in outlook and identity. And for the first time in Russian history, fear no longer pervades Russia's political life. That is a new reality with far-reaching consequences. It already signifies the onset of a new era in Russia's political culture. In a decade or two, that middle class will be shaping Russia's future, and in doing so, it will not be driven by imperial nostalgia. Ukraine could be a critical political accelerator in that process of change. Currently governed by a pro-Moscow regime that is fearful of the approaching Ukrainian parliamentary elections, the country is politically regressing. But 20 years of independence have instilled in the younger generation of Ukrainians a new identity and new pride in their independent statehood. The Ukrainians feel that their country is historically, dating back to the Kievan Rus, and culturally more European than Russia. Increasingly, they see their future as in some fashion a part of Europe, but not against Russia, but in Europe together with a democratic Russia. Admittedly, a larger, truly cooperative, and democratic Europe is a long-term prospect. I have no illusions in that regard. And we all know that the currently existing Europe is confronting an existential crisis. If not overcome, that crisis could undermine and even destroy much of what has been accomplished in Europe since World War II. Today's Europe of hope 
could then even give way to a reappearance of yesterday's Europe of hate. That is why today's Europe needs so urgently leaders guided by historical confidence and driven by truly continental ambitions. Let us recall that in the truly worst days of World War II, truly in the worst days of World War II, Churchill and Roosevelt met and proclaimed the Atlantic Charter as their vision of what perseverance and confidence in eventual victory will entail for America and for Europe. It was a vision of more than hope. It was an affirmation of historical responsibility for the future. Alas, it took longer than a military victory in World War II for the Atlantic Charter's vision to become reality. But 50 years after its proclamation, in large measure, also thanks to events that started here in Gdańsk, that vision became a reality not only for Western, but also for Central Europe. Today, the world in general, and Eurasia in particular, need a larger and longer range vision of a globally influential Europe. Otherwise, our still young 21st century threatens to become a century not dominated by hegemonic aspirations, but by intensifying global turmoil. It is therefore not too early for the leaders of Europe to emulate the examples set by Roosevelt and Churchill and dedicate themselves to the goal of a wider Europe that will be truly Europe. Thank you.